Hello, I am Vanderlei Banhato at the University of São Paulo here in Brazil. And this is Bill Phillips from the National Institute of Standard and Technology in the United States. We are presently the chair and vice chair of Commission C2 of IUPAP, which is the International Union for Pure and Applied Physics. And this commission has a job, which is to promote and to be worried a little bit about units, use it in general, and fundamental constants. And uh, this is of general concern, because after all, we all buy things, we all sell things, and we need to express quantities in terms of units. So either you're buying or selling or measuring units and by being fundamental. And of course, it is very important that everybody around the globe speak the same language. So we want to understand each other. We want to be able to make trades, commercial trades and scientific uh, cooperation. Therefore, having well established an international system of unit is uh, something that uh, promotes the development of the whole world in terms, in many, in many sense, not only science. So uh, today we're going to speak a little bit about the international system of unit, which is, as I said, is one of the topic we, as Commission C2 of IUPAP, has to promote. So Bill, could you tell us a little bit about the history of the international system of units to start this conversation? Mm -hmm. Well, the history of, of units goes back a long way uh, compared to the international system of units. In ancient Egypt, uh, the, um, uh, the unit of measure for distance was related to the length of the pharaoh's arm. And uh, the standards that they used were so accurate that today we're really impressed with how well made uh, the pyramids were. Uh, in ancient times, metrology was important. As, uh, as time went on, it continued that importance, as you indicated, for trade, uh, but also, as for the ancient Egyptians, for, uh, for construction. And as time went on, the demands of uh, metrology became greater and greater. It was necessary for people to have better and better ways of measuring things. And, as you pointed out, it became more and more important to have consistent sets of measure uh, from one place to another. In medieval times, each town might have its unit of length set into uh, stone in the town square, so all the transactions in that town would be uh, uniform with respect to measures of length. But as trade increased uh, across distances and as science became more sophisticated, it was absolutely necessary to have units that were universal. And so around the time of the French Revolution, one of the big changes in metrology happened, the beginning of what we call the metric system. The idea that the meter, uh, which was uh, at that point defined as being uh, uh, one uh, over 10 million of the distance from the pole to the equator along a meridian going through, through Paris, uh, uh, was supposed to be a universal standard of measurement and they sent people out to survey uh, that distance. And as you might imagine, it wasn't so easy to survey that <laughs> distance. Uh, uh, and uh, there was a war going on. Uh, and uh, in the end, they got a value and they enshrined that value in the length of a rod. The end-to-end the -end distance of that rod was the effective working standard for a meter around the beginning of the 19th century. Well, toward the end of the 19th century, a number of countries internationally got together and agreed to establish an International Bureau of Standards, what we now call the BIPM. And uh, at the BIPM is uh, the standard meter, the distance between two scratches on a plat meridian bar. And everyone in the world uh, agreed, everyone who was a signatory of that treaty, agreed that was going to be the meter for them and their domestic work, and that meant that internationally, everybody had the same meter. Now, over time, the uh, distance between two scratches on a platinum iridium rod was not sufficient uh, 
for the accuracy that was demanded. But that was the beginning of what we now call the International System of Units. Back then, the metric system or the MKS system, the meter, kilogram, second system, began in the 19th century as a way of providing an international standard for trade, for scientific exchange. Yeah, we know that uh, we measure length, we measure mass, we measure time. Those are important uh, quantities, but we measure other things. And we know that the international system of units today has a kind of uh, basis to build up on. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the, the, the set of uh, units that we uh, rely on to define the present international system of units? Yes, the, the, the present international system of units uh, comprises seven base units. You already mentioned three of them, mass, uh, length, and time. Mass today is defined uh, uh, in that a kilogram is exactly the mass of the international prototype kilogram, an actual artifact, a, a piece of, of platinum iridium, a, a right circular cylinder uh, that is kept in a vault uh, at the BIPM. Uh, length is no longer the distance between uh, two scratches on a meter bar. We have more sophisticated ways. And time, which used to be set by the length of the day, uh, 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, uh, is now uh, uh, kept by uh, atomic clocks. But there's more, as you indicated. The ampere, the unit of electrical current, is necessary because uh, electricity is so much a part of our daily lives, both scientifically and personally. We use electricity all the time. We have to measure it so we can pay for it. Uh, the ampere is the thing that we uh, use to define uh, electrical units. And the ampere is defined in terms of the force between current carrying wires. But that's not all. We measure temperature. And so we have uh, the base unit of the Kelvin, which is defined as being a certain fraction of the triple point of water above absolute zero. Then we have um, uh, the candela, the unit of, uh, of luminous intensity, uh, which is important for lighting when you have to specify what kind of lighting is necessary, for example, in a factory to ensure safety, uh, then you need a standard for doing that. And that's what the candela gives us. Well, besides the candela and uh, the ampere, we still have the mole. Indeed, the mole. And the mole is something that uh, chemists are very much concerned with. Uh, we want to know what the quantity of a substance is for making chemical reactions. And today, the mole is defined as being the number of entities that corresponds to the number of carbon-12 atoms in 12 grams of carbon-12. So that makes the seven units of the, of the SI. Yeah, well, uh, we all know that uh, as science advances, scientists find better ways of measuring things and find better ways of uh, defining things. So uh, that's basically why the definition of units improves. Indeed. And uh, so uh, tell me a little bit about uh, how is this business of science helping defining the units and units helping define mm -hmm. or improving mm -hmm. science? Well, the unit of length is a <laughs> great one to tell this story because it has a long history and it has a beautiful history in terms of the way improved science has made it possible to have improved definitions of length and how the improved definitions of length have made it, it possible to advance in science. As I mentioned, the ancient Egyptians had uh, a cubit and it was originally related to the length of the pharaoh's arm, uh, but then they realized that they needed a real physical standard. And so they made a rod out of stone, and then they made working standards that were compared on a regular basis to that rod. That was great for ancient Egypt, but as time went on, we needed better results. The ends of rods were not such a wonderful thing because they could wear down, and so they decided to put scratches. And that became the standard of length for a long time. But then people looked at the scratches and realized they didn't know where the center of the scratch was when you wanted to make it uh, measurements to a really fine degree. And so they replaced the, um, 
definition of the of the uh, of a meter uh, as being the length between two scratches on the rod with a certain number of wavelengths of light coming from a lamp made with krypton gas. But that, after a while, turned out to be insufficient because the purity of the light coming out of the krypton lamp was not perfect. And it was difficult to tell where the uh, center of gravity, so to speak, of the different wavelengths coming from the krypton lamp uh, was. And so, in 1983, there was what I considered to be the most beautiful definition of the meter. The meter was defined as the length that light travels in a certain amount of time. What that means is that in 1983, the speed of light became a defined quantity. No longer were we ever measuring the speed of light. We were defining the speed of light, and the experiments that in the past would have measured the speed of light are now what we do in order to realize the unit of the meter. And one of the things that made this possible was the scientific advance of being able to measure frequencies of light. Well, we, we all know that uh, the work of the international system of units is being wonderful. It's a reality for more than a century. And, uh, but we all know that there are limitations. So uh, to, to conclude our conversations, can you tell me a little bit about limitations that we have today on the international system of unit and what science and uh, unions and institutions like IUPOP are uh, uh, somehow making efforts to improve? Yes, well, uh, IUPAP was one of the main uh, forces behind the adoption of what we now have as the International System of Units. In 1960 was when we officially uh, adopted worldwide and named the, the present International System of Units, or the SI. So IUPAP's had a, a big historic role and continues to have an important role as the, uh, as the SI evolves. You talked about limitations. Uh, one of the big problems that we face today in metrology and in units is the unit of mass. Mass is the last thing uh, that is related to an artifact. There is an actual cylinder of platinum iridium that represents one kilogram. And whatever happens to that cylinder, that is still the kilogram according to uh, the definition. So if there's a little bit of extra dirt on that uh, 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 object, then the mass of everything else in the universe goes down. Well, that's kind of a, an uncomfortable situation for modern science. And today, we are in the process of coming up with a new definition of the kilogram that will not have this problem that the present definition of the kilogram has of depending upon how the kilogram is cleaned and what its history is, uh, we'll have something that will not change in time, and we'll talk about that in a future conversation. Well, that's very nice. Uh, IUPAP is, is very proud to be part of all the efforts to really promote and to make better the international system of units. And of course, this is something that does, has no end. We always be able to improve things. We always be able to define better the units. And we always be able to contribute for a more global use of the international units. So I thank you very much and thank you all for this conversation.